You're listening to Investigation Insiders by Integris Intelligence. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Investigation Insiders. Happy New Year. Uh, This is Farhad. Hope you're all well and safe. We are back from our December hiatus um, and excited for the upcoming year, both for Integris as a company and our podcast, Investigation Insiders. Um, Unbelievably, this is our 45th episode, and um, we have an incredible guest today, the assistant director in charge of the FBI's New York office, uh, James Smith. How are you, Jim? Hey, I'm doing great, Farhad. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Um, so I don't want to put any pressure on you, Jim, but, you know, 45, as you probably well know, um, was worn by arguably the best athlete of all time, Michael Jordan. So uh, we have high <laughs> for this episode. So uh, just uh, by way of introduction, um, unlike many of our other guests, I actually haven't known Jim for uh, a terribly long time. Uh, in fact, we first met after he uh, took the position here in New York. Fortunately, we've had the chance to talk on a number of occasions since. And needless to say, I, I think very highly of them. So thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us today, Jim. Oh, hey, thank you. I, I really appreciate, you know, um, um, you, you asking for myself to come on and, and talk to you and the community of what we're doing in the FBI as a whole, not just here in New York, but as a whole as an enterprise. So I, I really appreciate it. Excellent. Well, uh, we, we usually like to get started by getting to know a little bit more about you. So can you talk a little bit about how you became an FBI agent? Well, I uh, received my my college degree in mechanical engineering, and I worked in the airline industry for about 13 years. And um, I, I will say my family as a whole, uh, I have a lot of law enforcement and firefighters in my family, mainly from the Massachusetts, New England area. So it's, it's kind of like I have it in my blood, law enforcement. My father retired a police officer in Framingham, Massachusetts. He spent 32 years with the police department there. And I have numerous other relatives up there, sheriffs, um, uh, state troopers and all. So after about 13 years, I joined the bureau and um, became, of course, became an agent, went to the academy. And I was more right at the limit of my age. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows this, but the limit to join the FBI or any um, federal agency as a 1811 is 37, unless you have military experience in some other um, areas that you can go beyond 37. So I came in at 36 and I graduated from the academy a month before I turned 37. And um, that's where I went from there. I came into the bureau been in about 20 years and it's just been great. I've had a, a really good uh, journey through the FBI and starting it out in uh, Los Angeles. So and now I'm here in New York. Sure. So so what were some of your sort of like stops in between Los Angeles and New York? So I started in Los Angeles working violent crime, drugs and gangs, street gangs um, yeah. in Los Angeles. So, and I was also on the Los, our FBI Los Angeles SWAT team. So I, I saw a lot in the city, what was going on there, especially in the gang areas of whether it be Compton, California, or South Los Angeles. So that was, I would say, my foundation in, uh, in the organization. I learned a lot there. And then I, I went, I got promoted, and I went to our FBI headquarters where I, where I was in a unit called the MS-13 unit. And then I went over to what we call the International Violent Crime Unit. So that particular unit, we investigate any violent crime targeting U.S. citizen overseas that is non-terrorist related. So during that time period, the, the big threat, I would say, for U.S. citizens was the Somali pirate kidnappings that were happening. Sure. So I worked a lot with those investigations, not with um, uh, other violent crimes against U.S. citizens. And then I went back to Los Angeles where I became a supervisor of a squad 
of uh, violent crimes against children. And then I moved back over to uh, supervising a drug and gang squad. So I did that for a few years. And then I promoted to assistant special agent in charge in San Antonio. So I moved to San Antonio where I oversaw national security, cyber, and, and intelligence um, programs. So I was there for a little bit. Then I promoted to FBI headquarters again. So this was my second tour through headquarters where I became the chief of staff for our number three, which is associate deputy director. And then um, from there, I promoted to, um, to a special agent in charge of our Houston office. And I actually thought my career was going to end in Houston as the uh, special agent in charge until I got a phone call from the director asking me to come up to New York to be the assistant director in charge. So here I am in, in New York. It's been phenomenal, the things that, that are going on here. And I've been up here about six months now. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, that that sounds like, you know, uh, some career. And I'm sure there's a lot of details which we can't get into. Each, each detail might be a uh, show in and of itself. But... Do you have like a memorable moment or moments that really stick out during your time with the FBI? Gee, I won't say there's one particular because there's just so many, but I I can tell you this. um, Not too long ago, we had a kidnapping and um, in Houston. And when we recovered the victim, one of the victims, there were three that were kidnapped and they're being held for ransom. I would say the one lone victim, because we were able to negotiate the others, the first two out, and then the the third one, we had to do a hostage rescue. And hearing the victim come out where she was talking about how she thought her life didn't mean anything to anybody, Hmm. especially because the first two were released, and she thought she was going to die through the, the various steps that were happening while she was in captivity, I'll call it. And what the kidnappers were doing, she thought she was going to die. And she just thought no one loved her. No one appreciated her. No one did anything. And she thought she was the lowest of society. And she said, all of a sudden, she heard an explosion and she saw nothing but blue and red lights and guys in uniforms, green uniforms coming in the door to rescue her. And that's when she thought, oh, wow, people really think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a person, I'm appreciative. You know, it's just that the, what she responded with was very touching. And, um, and that's why we do what we do, because there are people out there who are victims. And it doesn't matter if it's a violent crime or if it's a financial crime. People just want to live life and do the right things. And we have so many We'll say people out there who feel that they have to commit crimes. So that's why we do what we do is to protect the community. And so people can live. And and that one particular one was touching because again, she said she just saw the men in green come through the door, rescue her. And that's when she realized how important she was or is. Sure. Now, I, I mean, you know, it, it's actually a really uh, touching story for obvious reasons. But, you know, one of the things and one of the reasons why I like having folks like yourself on the show is, you know, people get to hear direct from you guys about what you're doing every day. And obviously, uh, you know, it's not a secret that I think a lot of the work that's done not only by FBI agents, but other law enforcement agencies perhaps goes underappreciated. So it's, it's really nice to hear a story like that. And it's really nice to uh, see the reaction of the victim. So I guess one of the interesting things about like the New York office of the FBI is like it's it's really the flagship office, right? It's it's um, so how does it feel to be? in charge of the New York office. And I guess along with that, like, is it something that you aspired to or did it just take a natural course? Well, first, I would say it's a more of a natural course because uh, to, to head up the New York field office is not something you apply to become. Like now, when you, when you promote to special agent in charge in other positions, Internally, we have to apply for the position. So we have like resumes and we have these forms and all that we fill out. And then you go through the interview process. Whereas this position is not that way. It's 
more of an internal discussion and then a director calls you and asks you to take on this position and there are a few jobs like that so this particular one here uh, as the assistant director in charge and then we have a total of three assistant director in charges that's los angeles and our washington field office and of course new york so Again, it's a position that you're called upon. So when, when I was in Houston, I thought I was going to end my career there as a special agent in charge. Sure. And sure. I was already, you know, gearing up for that until I got the phone call um, to come up to New York. And it's a it's a it's a great opportunity within the bureau. So, uh, yes, I definitely said yes to this position. But the the difference between New York and some of the other offices is that this is the largest office in the FBI worldwide. When you count our um, agents, our professional staff, our intel analysts, and our TFO, task force officers, I would say, um, we, this is the largest. We have right around 3,000, I'll say. Um, and the magnitude that we cover in this office. So New York covers not only the city, we have Long Island, and then we have um, the Hudson Valley area, but we also cover investigations in Canada, Europe, and Africa that relate to the homeland. So yes, there's other offices that have investigations that attach to their particular city or their area, but we cover everything else. Um, and it's across the board, whether it be terrorism or criminal. So there's a lot going on worldwide that uh, that's on top of what's going on here in New York City, and it's it's a it's a a huge I would say tasking because everything in the city that we investigate is major, and you will hear about it on the news. When I don't mean just local news, you hear about it on world news, sure. and so you you have to always keep that in mind as you're progressing through investigations, and also it's a it's a major city. The world is always watching New York City, uh, no matter what it is, and you always have to keep that in mind as we're doing investigations, as we make arrests, as we speak to the media, you name it. So it's it's a it's a major office. Sure, sure. And so how how does it feel to be the first African American assistant director in charge of the New York office? I mean, I, I try not to think about that. Because I, I think it's pretty sad that I'm the first. Um, we've only had one other minority um, who was a Colombian, and we've only had one female right. um, assistant director in charge. So I think it's sad that it's taken this many years for us to diversify the, the office, to be honest sure. with you. Yep. Well, you know what? This uh, this is a good step and and obviously the right direction. And uh, you know, again, it, it takes effort, right, uh, to to change. So you know, so now that you've been in the role for, I guess, half a year, um, you know how you you have this perception. Maybe you you didn't think about this before you took it, but you have this perception of something, and then you take it over, and it's like, wow, this isn't maybe what I thought it would be, or maybe it is. How, how, how has that panned out for you? I mean, I'll put it like this. Each of the field offices that we have, they're, they operate the same. It's just the magnitude is different. The sure. cases are different. So internally, yeah, it's what I expected on how we work investigations. Externally, it's this is, again, this is a major city. So that's a heavy weight on not just me, but the office alone of what's going on here. Um, and it's not, and I asked me back, I shouldn't even just say the city, but I mean, if you look at what some of the cases that we've had, say in Africa, where we've had United States citizens who want to go fight, you name the war for some terrorist group, and they'll go over to Africa and then we, investigate it, we arrest them, and we bring them back. I mean, there's just such a huge magnitude when it comes to what we do here in New York compared to some of our other offices. And I'm not saying that they're not doing their job and they're not doing good work. No, I'm not saying that. But just the, 
the magnitude of what comes with New York is it's completely different. Sure, sure. And so what what do you what would you like to accomplish during your tenure here? And and how do you think you could achieve those sort of goals? Well, one thing we've we've always got to do is stay ahead of the threat. And what I mean by that is we cannot have one loss. Um, we're, law enforcement is one of those, and, and I would say even more or less the FBI, because of what we're tasked to do, which is to protect the homeland from terrorists, from and, that, and that's both international and domestic, that we can't take one, we can't lose one game. We have to go undefeated. Sure. If we lose a game, one game, it's devastating because then you have to, you know, you, you'll have folks looking into it. Then you next thing you know, various executive management are up on the hill testifying to why something happened. The director's up there testifying why something happened. And then you get all the, the, the naysayers, you know, targeting the FBI. So we have to be right on everything. And what I mean by that is when someone calls in a threat, we have to stop what we're doing. So we'll just say a shooting or something else. We have to stop what we're doing and we have to drill that down. So I'll give you an example of an office, uh, and it wasn't here in New York as recently. They received a call that a, a kid was going to go into the, a school the next day and commit a, a mass shooting. Right. So within 20, a 24 hour period, I can tell you what happened. The field office did their work. They immediately, the caller who called in the complaint was actually in Europe. They immediately reached out to our office in Europe. They were in front of that caller, interviewed them, did their work. We were able to identify the, the person who was going to commit the crime. It was in Alabama. We got in front of them and we identified a 13 year old girl who was going to take her father's guns. She already had her clothing. She already had her manifesto and she was going the very next day to commit this shooting. So just stop and think of how we didn't know who the shooter was. We didn't know who the, the complainant was and the FBI working with our partners had to stop everything they're doing and drill into it and protect the community. So that's what I mean is like the biggest thing I want to accomplish is that we're always staying ahead of the threat. We're always going to support our partners. And what I mean by partners, yes, it's easy to say we have law enforcement partners and we have such a great relationship here with everybody, but our partners in the private sector too. We want to protect them for some of the, the crimes that may that they may, be, may become victim to. So we're always out. I'm always out talking to not only the law enforcement partners and heads of agencies, but I'm always out talking to the various private sector companies, uh, the community and all, so we can stay ahead of the threat. So in, a, in an overall view, that that's what we have to do. I, I want to accomplish that. We're always getting better, staying ahead of the threat. We're always identifying areas that we need to pivot and to address. Um, that, that, that's my biggest thing I, I want to accomplish here. So as a citizen of, of the U.S. and, and it being a New Yorker, that, that's very comforting to know. And, and I think that everyone listening to the show, I mean, again, you're getting this direct from the person in charge. And I, I think that this, these are all really compelling points. So th thank you for sharing that. And I guess t on that note, it's a good segue into kind of what I was hoping to talk to you about today is looking at the year ahead and some of the uh, risks and, uh, you know, actions that is being taken not only by the FBI, but others to ensure that we continue to be safe and, you know, uh, are, are avoiding incidents. And like you're saying, it, it, it's kind of funny because uh, I started the show about Jordan and and being the greatest uh, ever and you know if he shot 45 percent that was fantastic so your analogy of you know you can't miss um, really hits home because I mean uh, 
that's not an easy test. So again, th thank you for sharing that. So let, let's talk about just, um, you, you mentioned it several times in what you just said. So the FBI is one component of law enforcement in New York, right? Can you talk a little bit about how you all work together with the other agencies to ensure that the city um, is safe? So I would say this, I, not only me, but the other heads of the agencies, we, we meet on a regular basis. Whether if it's one-on-one -on -one or a group setting, we're constantly talking, we're constantly communicating, um, and it doesn't matter which agency it is in our area that, of responsibility. But I would say it like this, though, um, regardless if it's a major event uh, or an investigation, we're embedded with each other. And what I mean by that is, you know, we have task force officers that are, they work 100% in our building. We have some agents who are working 100% in other buildings around the city. So we're all part of each other's fabric, we'll say, even though we're different agencies. So we're constantly sharing information. We're constantly preparing for major events. So like here in New York, the major events for the for the city will say start in August with the U.S. Open, and then we progress into the marathon, Thanksgiving parade. Um, we've got some others, and then we end with uh, the New Year's Eve event. So we sure. start preparing with our partners way in advance. So we're already preparing for next year's New Year's Eve event. We're already preparing for U.S. Open. And how we prepare is as soon as the event's over, we all do like after actions and understand, okay, what did we do good during this event? And what did we do bad? And what do we need to improve? And each event's different. And then as after we've, we've concluded with it, we start preparing for the, the following year or the next event. And it's not just here, it's around the country is what we do. So we're always communicating, we're always preparing, we're always trying to make things better. And we're always trying to stay ahead, again, of what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. And then we're always calling in resources too. So we'll say, I don't know, this year the Super Bowl's in Las Vegas. So Las Vegas has already been preparing for that event they've been praying for like two years for that event sure and if they don't have enough resources there they start calling in other offices and not just the, the local police but more of the federal police agencies they start calling in resources to help them out with that major event we're lucky here in new york because we have so many agents and professional staff ias and tfos that we don't call in too many other field offices we may call in newark or new haven um, but we normally don't, but some of the other offices that are smaller, they will, they will call them in for whatever event there is. So there's always that communication going on. There's always trying to be better the, the, the next event and always, how do we prepare ourselves for it? We're always practicing. We're always doing tabletop exercises or a full scale exercise on you name the event or the name, the threat like cyber. We're doing, you know, um, tabletop exercises with some companies or active shooter training, which we'll, we'll do with first responders. So we're always preparing. We're always practicing. Sure. Yeah. As, you know, just so you, you're aware, I, I mean, we had John DeVito from ATF on our last episode and, you know, he, he delivered the same message that you are. And. I think that's a great thing because, again, as we've learned from our past, the more cooperation there is, the more likely uh, that, again, you guys bat a thousand. So, um, so let's let's talk about like from the FBI standpoint. Uh, what are some of the things you're most concerned about? I guess both from an individual, like citizen perspective, as well as a company perspective uh, this year. Well. I'll go at some of the more violent ones first. So yeah. I'm really concerned with um, our domestic terrorists. And what I mean by that is homegrown U.S. citizens 
who are becoming radicalized. And you have two different types. You have the type that is being radicalized by a terrorist organization where they go into these chat rooms and they talk to or they read about um, hate that's coming out of those terrorists towards the United States. And then you have the other ones who just are domestic terrorists who hate people. Uh, it's not a, 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 we'll say, a cause for an international terrorist group. It's just they hate people because maybe the color of their skin or their religion or just in general, they just hate and they're becoming radicalized. And the, the fear that I have and others have is that these these people are not communicating with others. So they're sure. just becoming radicalized. You don't have any, we'll say, trip wires or any information to say that, hey, this person is going to go do something. And then right. finally, they just arm themselves and something snaps in their head and they go out and they conduct an attack. Um, and they, our citizens are, become victims and sadly some of them have perished and some of them are just affected for the rest of their life. So that that's really a, a big concern I have because when you're U.S. citizens, we don't have the same tools in the toolbox that we do for international terrorists that we can investigate. We can use to investigate because they're U.S. citizens. Sure. So um, that's a concern with me. Another one I have is right now because of all the wars that are going on, um, we have a lot of intel officers in our country, especially here in New York. We have a lot of spies here, sure. and. They're constantly out trying to, whether it be steal our technology or understand our military, our government, and the way we have life here. So we have a lot in New York. So we're, we're trying to deal with that. Um, another area is the cyber crimes that we're having with our private sectors. I mean, I, I believe it was J.P. Morgan who recently last week came out and said they get targeted over 65,000 times a day. So just think if that's them, you know it's happening to everybody else. Yep. So that's a concern because that affects all of us. Just, just think New York is the major financial hub for the entire world. Trillions and trillions of dollars flow through in and out of New York. And to have these cyber actors, whether they are nation state or regular hackers consistently doing this, is it's it's a problem sure and then finally I'll, I'll end on the fentanyl crisis um that is a, a major crisis that we're having in this country of people of all types of all ages that are dying from fentanyl mm -hmm. so we here in the fbi i should say new york um we're working with our partner especially dea to 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 address it so um and that's a shift we did we're currently doing right now. I mean, we worked the fentanyl, but it wasn't like what we're gonna we're gonna do now. We're gonna really target uh, the crisis and move forward from there. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on artificial intelligence and the impact it'll have on crime? Yeah, and actually, I, I failed to mention that when you were asking about uh, the threats and all. Artificial intelligence, it's gonna be amazing. It's also going to be super scary. And yeah. the reason why I say that is, is because governments have not put rules around artificial intelligence. Sure. They have not passed laws and all that says, you know, companies can do A, B, C, and you can't do uh, X, Y, Z. Right. Um, and that's what's going to have to happen because right now we're having an issue of People, you know, new uh, citizens' information is getting, getting out, being stolen. Can you imagine right. with AI how it's going to be? I mean, you're going to walk into stores and they're immediately going to not only recognize you, they're going to have your credit card already in their system and right. they're just going to start, you know, charging you immediately. Yeah. So can you imagine now hackers getting that information? <laughs> and then not only that, it's we're going to have to have laws out there that are going to be have to have a serious punishment for um, um, people's information getting out there through AI. Right now, we don't have really strict laws. You know, it's, it's not like you're, you're going to go to jail for 10, 15 years for stealing someone's PII. 
they're just not. That's just the way the laws are written. They, they, we're going to have to get tougher with our laws. We're going to have to really take AI serious and take it to the next level. But AI is going to be amazing as it is developed. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I, I imagine that as much defense as we'll have to play, it may play a role into the offense against uh, crime as well. So that that should be interesting just to see how that all develops. But again, it's it's good to know that it's on everyone's mind and that it's it's something that you know obviously this is going to be a little bit of a um <laughs> things developing after incidents so um obviously one of the major things going on here in the u.s is the election and just wondering what concerns the fbi has related to that and what the i guess the fbi's role in the overall process will be related to ensuring yeah, all, you know, the safety and security related to that. Yeah, so elections are kind of tricky because we have the Hatch Act that there's only so much we can do while the elections are going on. So what I mean by that is no federal agency can be at a poll station with your ray jackets or your badges out or anything like that. We cannot the laws prevent us from doing it. Um, and there's so many layers we have to go through to respond to a poll, polling station if something were to happen there. And what I mean by that is like we have to call back to our headquarters. We got they got to go talk to DOJ. I mean, there's a whole laundry list that we have to go through before we can even respond. So it's tricky in the fact of we can't be out there, but yet we are here in our office during the elections. We'll, you know, we'll have a command post to take incoming calls if something were to happen. Then we go through the process to respond. So it's tricky. Um, the biggest thing about elections, though, is just the, the misinformation that's out there. That that's a concern that, and it's usually nation state actors that are putting out just false information, and American citizens are listening to it, which they shouldn't. I mean, as we all know, there are whether it be Russia, China, or Iran, there are offices back there who've gotten all kinds of awards and medals because of the misinformation they've put out that has detoured our elections or some of the infighting that's going on. And that's what they want. They want to just disrupt our democracy here. And um, that's a concern. Sure. No, absolutely. Um, so uh, Talk to us a little bit about what you think um, the general public as well as U.S. companies can do. Uh, it doesn't just have to be U.S. companies, but companies here in the U.S. Uh, can do to help themselves and sort of help the FBI's mission to, to keep us safe. Well, um, one is to build on relationships that we currently have with these, the various companies. Uh, like I said, I'm always out talking to them. We have to have a strong relationship, regardless of the size of the company. Uh, I'm, I'm in the process right now of assigning an Intel analyst just to work with the companies, the financial companies that are here. And that is this particular intelligence analyst. They will know the, at the worker level who the analysts are at all of the, the financial institutions here in New York. And then to continually just go back and forth and share information. And of course, not going to be proprietary or protected information, but it's going to be overall information about the threats and how can we work together and arm um, each other. And, and we want to make it so that as we're receiving intelligence, important intelligence, that it is going out to these financial institutions in a matter of seconds. Uh, when I was in Houston, that's what I did with the energy, oil, gas, and energy companies. We assigned an Intel analyst to work with them, and that's been amazing. They share information. They meet with each other all the time. So we, we've got to have strong relationships, especially at the, at the, at the, at the C-suite level or the um, CSO or CISO level. We have to have strong relationships with them. 
so that they know they can call me or another executive in this office 24 7 on a particular problem we're going to respond and we're going to protect them and not release any information out about what has happened to them sure so we have to I mean, and not that we're not there now we some companies we have really strong relationships with others mm -hmm. we don't and yeah. it's and it's and I, I mentioned the financial and um uh companies here but it's all companies i mean you look at we've got headquarters for the nfl nba major league baseball i mean we have to have strong relationships with them we have yeah. to have strong relationships with uh, the real estate companies that are here we have i mean there's so many different groups or uh that are here in the city we, we have to have relationships again so they can call us anytime and we will respond 24 7 to to whatever's happening sure i i, I think that's a great um I think that's a great theme uh, because, again, uh, you don't you don't want to find out at the scene or after an incident who your counterparts are, who who's the point of contact, who knows what, and all that. Because again, there's a whole process to just getting to know each other. So I, I think that's a great point. Um, so um, I guess just some other general question: what, what are some of the misconceptions that you've heard about? Um, the FBI that are not only untrue, but potentially dangerous for agents and the community as a whole? Well, the one thing I, I, I'll be honest, with, I do not like, and it's not just FBI, it's all law enforcement, how we're really being targeted right now. We're going through a time in our history where, you know, the bad actions of a, of 1% of law enforcement has caused a major backlash against law enforcement, whether if it's defunding the police or whether if it's um, investigations that the FBI's had that were corrupt or anything like that. I'll put it like this. It doesn't matter what the job is, what the industry is. You have that very small percentage of bad people, you know, and, and again, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, just recently we arrested somebody who was inside of a company who was giving out secrets to others to invest in their companies. I mean, that's a, you know, that's a, it was a major, major investigation. When I'm, I'm saying major, I'm meaning dollar amounts. We're talking millions of dollars. It was an insider trading um, investigation. So do we now say that every hedge fund or everyone who's working within those industries, are they all corrupt? No, you have one person or you may have, you know, a couple but the whole industry shouldn't be blasted because of one person i mean look at what's going on with the healthcare fraud we've got doctors out there that are defrauding the systems all right but do we say now every doctor out there is bad no when you're sick who do you go see when you need a open heart surgery who do you see you know just like with law enforcement someone's breaking in your house or shooting at you who are you calling Right. You're calling. You're calling the police. You're calling the FBI. So, I, I I think it's bad that people feel this way, and we've got to get beyond that. There's always going to be uh, a, a small percentage that are bad in every industry out there. Sure. And and one of the reasons why we're hearing about it so much is because of social media. Right. You know, it, you can get information in a matter of seconds. Now, everything that we've that has happened. Um, whether it be law enforcement or others, that's been happening for the entirety of our history. It's just that right. people know more about it now. I mean, there were things that were going on in the FBI back in the 60s and 70s that if people knew about it, it'd be like, oh, what the hell? You know, I mean, it's far worse than what you're seeing now. Um, right. We had an agent who actually committed a murder. But no one, you know, we, we've, not only us, but there's others out there um, that have, done bad things that, you know, we got, we got to think about, we got to think through this more. It's, it's just a small percentage. You, you know, again, I, for some reason, your, your, your um, sort of anecdote earlier about having to, you know, bat a thousand, right? Like um, shoot a hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's really uh, interesting because again, you guys 
are being held to that standard. And you're right. Every single industry, every single, I mean, you talk about religious institutions, you talk about schools, you talk about anything, and there are, there are some bad apples there. And so, you know, it, th that may go back to also the sort of communication piece that you were talking about as far as the, with other agencies, but maybe the community and working together. So um, hopefully, again, there's a way to bridge that gap. Um, the, I'll, I'll, you know, say this. Yeah. I'll say this. I'll say this. You hit a good point there, and I didn't mention it earlier, was communication. Yeah. So the FBI of the past, will say, was always behind a wall and they didn't want to share information and they didn't want to go out and tell people, Hey, what we're doing. Well, the FBI has evolved and we're out more, but I can tell you with me as the assistant director in charge and, and the folks in the office know this because I, I preach this every day is that I want to tell our story to the community. Yeah. I am big on yeah. talking to the media, telling them the great work that we're doing internally. I would love to talk about every arrest that we have almost every day. But of course, we all have rules and, you know, everything else. So there's only certain things I can go out and say or when I can't get in front of the camera. But I want to get out as much as possible telling the community what we are doing in the FBI every day. I don't want, and it's nothing against the media, I don't want them telling our story. And I say this to them. I recently had a meet and greet, when, I shouldn't say recent, but when I first got here, a meet and greet, and I brought in, I don't know, 15, 12 or 15 media reps, and we just went back and forth, and I told them, I said, hey, just ask, and we'll tr we will get to yes one way or another, but I want, I want to tell the story. I don't want them to tell the story, because the community needs to hear from me, especially as the assistant director in charge of the FBI in probably the biggest city in the world. I need to tell the story, not somebody else. That's my job. So communication is is very important to me. Sure, uh, but you, uh, if you talk to our staff here, you'll uh, I'm sure they're tired of hear, hearing me talk about that. But the um, you know, like your predecessor, who we are a huge fan of here at Integris and the show, Mike Driscoll. Um, I think I think it's so important that. You were not only willing to have the New York office participate, but you were willing to do it yourself. I think that shows a strong commitment to community. And I, I think what you just said is so powerful. Don't let someone else write your ticket. You write it, right? You you you, you put the message out that you want to be heard. Um, so with that being said, can you talk a little bit about... Um, how your office wants to interact with the community, what what the community means to the FBI being successful? Well, one, we have so many programs internally. We have the community outreach program, uh, I would say group of personnel, uh, I want to say we have like five here in New York. Yeah. And F well, their job 100% is to go out in the community and um, engage with them. And if, even if it means bringing in myself or others in the office to give presentations to talk about certain items, um, we do it. So, uh, you know, once the war started over in the Middle East, we went out to the various communities I did, you know, and talked to them about the threat or certain things out there. Um, but we also have, as you know, um, as, as your alumnus, the, the FBI Citizens Academy, sure. where we bring in. Um, non-law enforcement, and and they're and they're part of the community at all different levels, and they come in for eight weeks, and we talk about the FBI. We educate them on what we do, and as you know, it's a long time. It's it's a good chunk of your time yep. that you're here in our office for eight weeks, and it's usually like what a Wednesday or Thursday night for about three hours for that eight consecutive week. Yeah. So we have that program. We have the InfraGuard program where that's more targeting cyber, where again, we're out working with the community, we're working with the companies and talking about the cyber threats. Uh, but yeah, so we're, we're just out there now. We're out there a lot more than we were historically. And I mean, I, I can tell you when I was in Houston as the FBI special agent in charge, 
I, when the Houston Astros won the World Series, I was with um, Houston Police Chief Troy Finner, and we actually marched through the parade together. He and I were side by side. Right. Why? Because the community needs to see me out there. They need to see the FBI with Houston Police Department. And let them know that, hey, we're partners. Sure. They had a, um, a Juneteenth event in Houston. I went with the chief. And it was like an, an all-day event where people out in the streets having barbecues and everything else. It's like the 4th of July, an African-American community in Houston. I was out with him, shaking hands, talking to people, you know. And that's what we need to do. We have to be out there to show people that we're human, just like they are. And we also got to show the community that they're important. It doesn't matter what level you're in or what community you live in. You're important to us, regardless. So my job is to be out there, and people need to see me. They need to see the other agents and professional staff out out there. I can't tell you how many times people come up to me, wow, this is the first time I've ever met an FBI agent. And for sure, I would never expected to meet a black FBI agent, you know? So um, that's, what that's what I'm trying to change. Sure. Sure. So uh, let's talk a little bit about like the FBI is always obviously looking for new recruits, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about the different types of positions available? And because I think people just think about the, the special agent position and then how would someone find out more about like applying and getting into the FBI? So in the FBI, we have, you name it, we have a position here, whether if it's in human resources whether if it's in training, um, language services. So as you know, we're, we're a worldwide law enforcement um, agency. Yep. So some of the, I should say a lot of the information we're, we're receiving is in a foreign language. So we have to have translators here. And it's not just translating what every word says, but what does it truly mean? And what's the culture of that community? So we have thousands of translators here. Um, we have facility personnel here who look after our facilities. People forget we have a big, we, we have structures, we have buildings. Someone has to manage that. Someone has to ensure the lights are coming on. Someone has to ensure that the light bulbs are replaced. Um, we have budget personnel who are dealing with our budgets daily and our spending. And then of course, we have Intel analysts, um, we have agents and how you find out about these jobs is you just go on fbijobs.com yep. and you apply. I'm sorry, fbijobs.gov. fbijobs.gov is what we have. And you apply. I mean, you're right. Everybody thinks that we're just, we're just hiring agents. No, we're hiring across the board. We're hiring sure. media right now. Um, and then, of course, the backgrounds of folks. We want a, a diversified background. Sure. And not only, you know, on a professional staff, but agents too. Everyone, a lot of people think we have to be a former law enforcement, military, or a lawyer. Well, that's completely false. Do we want them? Yes. But we want a variety of of people. We In my academy class, we had teachers. We had, of course, engineer myself. Uh, we had salesmen. Actually, I had a potato salesman in my class, and he's now overseas working in, a, in an international assignment. Um, but we have so many people that come in with different backgrounds, and that's what we need. We can't just have law enforcement, military, or lawyers. We have to have a variety of people because you have to know what you're looking at when it comes to investigations. We've had doctors medical doctors, pilots. Um, I can keep going on. Yeah. But again, fbijobs.gov. That's I, I think that's an excellent sort of uh, segue to the conclusion of the show. Um, I, I, you know, first of all, again, I want to thank you for your service to the country. Um, I mean, without what you guys do every day, I think uh, we wouldn't be able to rest as easy as we do. Second, I, I want to thank you again uh, for joining the show and offering your candid 
um, sort of take on the questions that I ask. And thank you know our listeners for tuning in. I'm sure this is going to be a very popular episode, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate you know you taking the time to talk to me about the FBI and what's going on. And and I'd like to close with this with the community is that hey, if you see something out there that's not right. Do not hesitate to call the FBI. You can call us here in New York. You can call our hotlines. You can call local law enforcement. But if you see something out there and it doesn't matter if it's a crime that's in place or a crime you think that's happening or even if it's a loved one that you think is becoming radicalized and all, please, please let us do our job and we will decide if it's something important or not. And we will not, you know, chastise anyone or anything like that because they reported something that didn't come to fruition of anything. Don't worry about that. We get calls all the time. Uh, I just wish we got more, especially when someone's gone out and done a mass shooting when someone knew that they were becoming radicalized and also. But again, thank you all again for um, allowing me to come on and, and talk to you. Thanks so much, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Until next time. Don't forget to follow us. We are on LinkedIn and Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube.